The Lord be with you. Welcome to Grace Lutheran Church here in Regina, Saskatchewan. I'm Pastor Aaron Gust. It's good to see you. Friends, today we join in Epiphany 4, the fourth Sunday after the Epiphany, and our theme is the Word of God, who He is, how He speaks, and what He gives with authority and power to you, so that you may be confident of your salvation. With that, let us turn to the order of service, which will be the prayer and preaching service. If you're at home and you have a Lutheran service book, it's page 260. If not, follow along. I'll put enough things on the, the screen that you can easily and enjoyably follow with the service. We begin. This is the day which the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. From the rising of the sun to its setting, the name of the Lord is to be praised. Better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of the wicked. Make me to know your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Sanctify us in your truth. Your word is truth. From the rising of the sun to its setting, the name of the Lord is to be praised. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Let us sing the Old Testament canticle. The Old Testament reading for the fourth Sunday after Epiphany comes to us from the prophet Jeremiah. This text, along with the gospel text, will serve as a basis of today's sermon. Now, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you, and before you were born, I consecrated you. I appointed you a prophet to the nations. Then I said, Ah, oh, Lord God, behold, I do not know how to speak, for I am only a youth. But the Lord said to me, Do not say I am only a youth, for to you all to whom I send you, you shall go, and whatever I command you, 
you shall speak. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you to deliver you, declares the Lord. Then the Lord put out his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said to me, Behold, I have put my words in your mouth. See, I have set you this day over nations and over kingdoms to pluck up and to break down, to destroy and to overthrow, to build up and to plant. Well, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our second reading is St. Paul's letter to the Corinthians, the first letter, chapter 12. The apostle writes, I will show you a still more excellent way. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to move mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. If I give away all I have, and if I deliver up my body to be burned, but have not love, I gain nothing. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices in the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. As for prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. But when the perfect comes, the partial will pass away. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I gave up childish ways. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I have been fully known. So now faith, hope, and love abide, these three, but the greatest of these is love. Well, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our gospel for today comes from Luke chapter 4, and as I said earlier, it, along with Jeremiah, will serve as the basis of today's sermon text. Jesus went down to Capernaum, a city of Galilee, and he was teaching them on the Sabbath. And they were astonished at his teaching, for his word possessed authority. And in the synagogue there was a man who had the spirit of an unclean demon, and he cried out with a loud voice, Ha! Ha! What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus, rebuking him, saying, Be silent and come out of him. And when the demon had thrown him down in their midst, he came out of him, having done him no harm. And they were all amazed and said to one another, What is this word? For with authority... And power, he commands the unclean spirits, and they come out. And reports about him went out into every place in the surrounding region. And he arose and left the synagogue and entered Simon's house. Now Simon, uh, that's Peter, uh, Simon's mother-in-law was ill with a high fever, and they appealed to him on her behalf. And he stood over her and rebuked the fever, and it left her, and immediately she rose and began to serve them. Now when the sun was setting, and all those who had any who were sick and with various diseases brought them to him, and he laid his hands on every one of them and healed them. And demons also came out of many, crying, You are the Son of God. But he rebuked them and would not allow them to speak, because they knew that he was the Christ. And when it was day, he departed and went into a desolate place. And the people sought him and came to him and would have kept him from leaving them. But he said to them, I must preach good news of the kingdom of God to the other towns as well. For I was sent for this purpose. And he was preaching in the synagogues of Judea. Well, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our responsory. 
Forever, O Lord, your word is firmly set in the heavens. Lord, I love the habitation of your house and the place where your glory dwells. Blessed are those who hear the word of God and keep it. Lord, I love the habitation of your house and the place where your glory dwells. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. Lord, I love the habitation of your house and the place where your glory dwells. Well, let us take a moment and we're going to refresh ourselves as a, with a few of the catechism things, uh, things like the Ten Commandments. Let's join in confessing them together. You shall have no other gods. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Honor your father and your mother. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his manservant or maidservant, his ox or donkey or anything that belongs to your neighbor. Together, let us also confess our faith and pray at the same time the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us always to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Oh, we join now in singing the hymn of the day.
let us pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, may the words of my mouth, may the meditation of each one of our, uh, our hearts be pleasing in your sight for the sake of your Son, the Word made flesh, who declares us holy in your sight. Amen. Grace and peace and mercy are all yours through faith in Christ Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Well, Grace, uh, dear baptized, talk is cheap. Actions speak louder than words. Don't just say it, do it. You're familiar with those phrases. They are the words that we use when we want to speak and communicate uh, that your words or another person's words don't mean that much to us. Perhaps it's because we are surrounded with so many words. So much chatter in our ears. Words become like static, cluttering our ears. Friends, when something is in plentiful supply, it tends to be considered cheap. And so when words are abundant, we begin to devalue words, throwing them around carelessly, loosely, without regard to their power. Friends, words can start wars. They can also end them. Words can begin a romance, and they can end them too. Words can comfort, they can terrify, they can tickle, they can bring joy, hurt, they can console. Words can carry information, knowledge, and wisdom. Words can be written down, recorded, handed on, and preserved. Just imagine a world without words we would be isolated, unable to communicate. And just think of the very thing that we uh, celebrate with our little ones. It's their very first words. Their first coherent string of syllables. So much so, we mark it and we celebrate it and remember it. No mistake about it, words are powerful. Just consider those words which come with authority. Consider the words of a judge who, when reading the sentence, can put you behind bars. Imagine the words of the legislature who can define the punishment and rewards. Imagine when one who is an authority speaks that their words carry the authority that was given them. And when one who has power speaks, their words carry their power. So when the Son of God, who is the Word, when He speaks the Word, His words come with the power and authority of God. And friends, that's the point of today's Old Testament reading from Jeremiah and the Gospel of Luke. The point is the power and authority of the Word of God. Well, let's take a look at that. I want you to begin by thinking, how does the Bible begin? It begins with the Word. In the beginning was the Word. The creation week is really six days of God speaking. And God said, and it was so. You see, the word says what it does. Be light, and light there is. God does by speaking. Notice he doesn't pick things up with his hands. He doesn't use tools. Well, I guess he does. He uses his voice. He speaks, and his word is his tool. And it has all the authority and the power of God. And when the word speaks, it does what it says. In Hebrew, uh, the word for word is davar. And it means not only word, but it also means an event. The word is an event. 
The word happens. The word of God never returns empty or void. It always accomplishes what God intends and purposes with it. So when the prophets of the Old Testament spoke, they weren't speaking idle words. They weren't speaking their opinions. They were speaking the word of God that he had put into their mouths. And in speaking the word, the event happened. Well, now it may have taken a few decades and and sometimes even centuries for that word that the prophets spoke to have worked themselves out. But the mouth of the Lord had spoken it, which means it was as good as done according to his time. In the Old Testament today, God called a reluctant prophet. His name was Jeremiah. Notice, none of the prophets ever volunteer for prophetic duty. God must call the prophet. He doesn't put a job description out there and wait for some applicants to show up. No, the word of the Lord comes to the prophet. The prophet then doesn't come to the word. Jeremiah had been appointed by God to be a prophet before he was born. So much for making a decision here. Remember, it starts off like this. Before I formed you, Jeremiah, it's in Jeremiah here. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you. I appointed you a prophet to the nations. Jeremiah doesn't have much of a chance here. He doesn't have much of a choice. God said it. And it was so. Not that Jeremiah didn't try his best to get out of doing his prophetic duty. Remember, he says, oh, I'm young. I don't know how to speak. God says, never mind that. Go where I send you. Speak what I command you. And do not be afraid of anyone, for I am with you to deliver you. Then the Lord put out his hand, and he touched Jeremiah's mouth. And you say, hey, wait a minute. God doesn't have hands. Friends, whenever you see God in the Old Testament with hands, whenever you see him with human stuff, don't just think God, think Christ. This is Christ, the Word, touching the prophet's lips. You say, but Christ doesn't have hands yet. And I say, friends, do not limit Christ with your clocks or with your calendars. If he wants hands ahead of the time he takes upon flesh, he can do that. Christ touches the lips of Jeremiah the way the angel touched the lips of Isaiah with those burning coals of incense. Behold, I have put my words in your mouth. See, I have set you this day over nations and over kingdoms to pluck up and to break down, to destroy and to overthrow, to build and to plant. And all of it with nothing but the word. Jeremiah didn't have political power. He didn't have might or clout or connections. He didn't have an army. He had nothing but the word of God, the very word that the Lord put on his lips. But that word also had authority. It had authority and it had the power of God to topple kingdoms, tear down, to restore, to build up and to plant. Enter Jesus at Capernaum. Jesus is more than a prophet. We're now into the Gospel of Mark. He doesn't simply have the word in his mouth. He is the word in the flesh. And this is the cause of great astonishment. He teaches with the authority of God because he is God. And when a demon decides to disrupt things and distract the hearers, the word of Jesus silences the demon and casts it out on the spot, leaving the possessed man unharmed. Quite a show, no doubt. And the people were all amazed. Not only is his teaching 
with authority, but his words have power over the demonic realm so that the demons have no choice but to obey. Now, that's pretty exciting, maybe pretty aggressive side of God's word with power and authority, but there's also a tender and a personal side as well. We see that at work as Jesus leaves the synagogue and he heads to Simon Peter's house, which, by the way, on the front steps of that synagogue, I have stood there. It's very cool to see. You can see the house that they're talking about. It would have been only about a quarter of a block away. Jesus heads to Simon Peter's house, and there Peter's mother-in-law is, in, is sick with a fever. I guess it's flu season. She's not feeling well. Jesus, please, won't you help her? It seems so trivial after the demon incident. A fever? Well, she'd get over that by herself uh, in a day or so. You know, take two Tylenol, drink plenty of fluids, and she'll be better in no time. So why trouble Jesus with something so slight as a little flu bug? Well, she's important to Jesus, precious to him. So he goes to her bedside, and again, he delivers his words. He rebukes the fever the same way he did with the demon. Demons, disease, it's all the same thing. They're both signs of the fall of mankind. It's what Jesus has come to fix. It's what Jesus has come to die for. He rebukes her fever, and immediately it leaves her, just as the demon left the poor man at the synagogue. All because Jesus said so. The word does what it says, filled with authority and power. Well, you can imagine what happened when the word got out about the word of Jesus. The whole town came with their diseased and demonized. It looked like an emergency room on a Saturday night. And that day, Jesus healed everyone who was sick and rebuked every demon. Finally, though, it was the next morning. He slipped away for some alone time in a solitary place. And the people clamored after him for more and would have kept coming until every sick and demonized person in the world would have been fixed. But Jesus needed to leave town. He pressed on to go somewhere else. He says, I must preach the good news of the kingdom of God to the other towns as well, for I was sent for this purpose. Friends, Jesus was sent to preach the news, the good news, the word. He wasn't sent to heal people one by one, as nice as that was for Simon Peter, uh, Peter's mother-in-law. He wasn't sent to cast out each and every demon, as impressive as, 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 impressive as that was in the synagogue. He wasn't sent to deal with every cold and every flu and every cancer and every clogged artery on a case-by-case -case basis. As much as we would think that would be the best solution, the best way to operate. No, the reason Jesus was sent by the Father wasn't to fix the world, but to redeem it. Not to right all the world's wrongs, but to die for the wrongs of this world. Not to heal people one at a time, but to take away the sin of the world by taking it into himself, all of it, and dying on a cross with it to defeat it. He also did not come to defeat every demon one by one, but to beat the devil at his own game by becoming our sin, diving into our death, disarming the law, and rising from the dead victorious. There, friends, there is the marvel 
and the mystery. The one who is the word and who spoke the word with power and authority came to be silenced in death so that the kingdom of God could come with power. That his word could come with power and authority also to you. The very same word that silenced the demons and raised old ladies from their sickbeds, yes, that very word, ponder that, that word comes now to you. I forgive you all your sins. When he says that in holy absolution through the pastor, that's his words speaking into your ears. When you can be in the house of the Lord and gathered with the communion of the saints and you hear the words, this is my body given for you, my blood shed for you for the forgiveness of all your sins, that is Jesus' words into your ears. Dear friends, that same word with the same power and authority comes to you even today, hearing the word of God preached into your ears preached with the forgiving word to heal you, to restore you, and to raise you up from being dead to sin to being alive in Christ. Remember, the word of God does what it says. The word is the event itself. You, through faith in Christ Jesus, are sinful no more. You are forgiven you are cleansed. The demons are all silenced. And death has no sway. The law cannot accuse you. Friends, all of this is because Jesus says so. And Jesus is the word with all authority and all power. In his holy name, amen. Or well, may the peace which surpasses all human understanding guard and keep our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Well, let us pray. In peace let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the gift of divine peace and of pardon with all our heart and with all our mind, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the holy Christian church, here and scattered throughout the world, for our brothers and sisters in Bulamuti, Uganda, and for the proclamation of the gospel and the calling of all to faith, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For this nation, for our cities and communities, for our common welfare of us all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For seasonable weather and for the fruitfulness of the earth, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For those who labor, for those whose work is difficult or danger, and for all who must travel, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For all those in need, for the hungry and the homeless, the widowed and orphaned, for all those in prison for their Christian faith, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the sick and the dying, especially those whom we name in our hearts, Lord, for all those who care for them, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Finally, for these and for all our needs of body and soul, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Our collect for this day. Almighty God, you know we live in the midst of so many dangers that in our frailty we cannot stand upright. Grant strength and protection to support us in all dangers and carry us through all temptations. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Blessed Lord, you have caused all holy scriptures to be written for our learning. Grant that we may so hear them, read, mark, learn, and take them to heart, that by the patience and comfort of your holy word, we may embrace and ever hold fast the blessed hope of everlasting life. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, 
one God, now and forever. Amen. I thank you, my heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have kept me this night from all harm and danger, and I pray that you would keep me this day also from sin and every evil, that all my doings in life may please you. For into your hands I commend myself, my body and soul in all things, that your holy angel be with me, that the evil foe may have no power over me. Amen. Well, we sing now the New Testament canticle. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Almighty and merciful Lord, the Father, the Son, and Holy Spirit, bless and preserve you. Amen. Well, thank you for sticking with us all the way to the end, and I pray that the Lord would bless you with his word. Having received him, having had your sins forgiven, that you would know and trust this, because when Jesus says it, it is done. Go in God's peace. Amen. <laughs>